So hello everyone, I'm Melanie Fallick and welcome to Making a Life the Conversation. We've had all sorts of technical issues in the last 35 minutes, including my Wi-Fi not working at all, but somehow we're here and I think there are over 300 of you here as well. So thank you so much. Um, we were going to start with a, a slideshow that was going to show Nepenthe, which is the place in Big Sur where Cape and Aaron both spent their formative years, um, 25 years apart, but we weren't able to get the slideshow to work. But I want you to imagine being 800 feet above the Pacific Ocean in a log cabin, actually the log cabin that Aaron is in right now, that is where, um, that is the home that Kaif moved into, I believe, as a preteen after his family moved to Big Sur. And his parents built an amazing place called Nepenthe. In addition, in adding to the log cabin, they built a restaurant that has an amazing deck. Um, the idea was that they wanted to share this beautiful place, this beautiful view with people everywhere. And they wanted to create a gathering place for creatives. So I think what we're trying to do today is gather in a different way. We are together apart. And I think it's really special to be here with you. Um, I feel like having been to Nepenthe and knowing Cape and Aaron, I feel so honored to sort of be having been brought into their fold. Um, and I, I just want to give you a little background. I actually met Cape in the 1990s um, in the Shetland Islands. Um, we were on a Rowan trip together. And although I obviously continued to follow what he was doing for many years, we didn't reconnect again for until about 20 years later. And then I became Cape's editor for a bunch of his books, um, including Dreaming in Color, which is Cape's autobiography. Oh, I love that book. And um, I, of course, felt so honored that he trusted me with something so special. And I had the privilege of actually going to Big Sur and spending time at Nepenthe with Kaif and his family, including Aaron. And so I met Aaron in 2012. And I'm honored to call them friends. And I'm incredibly honored that they agreed to be my first guests on Making the Life the Conversation, which is a outgrowth of my book, Making a Life, Working by Hand, and Discovering the Life You Were Meant to Live. Um, to get started, I just want, I think we're doing really well. I want everybody to make sure that they keep their mics muted. And um, that's really important. If you want to talk to us in the chat, which is in the bottom right corner, please do so. Um, I would love to know where you're all from. So please type that in if you can. Um, if you have questions, those are going to happen in the chat, but they're going to happen. Um, I want you to direct them, if you can remember to do this, to ask questions. And that, when you do that, those questions will all go to Caitlin Reclusado, who is uh, right here. And Caitlin Hi. works at the Phoenix Shop, which is a treasure trove of a boutique at Nepenthe. And the Phoenix Shop, I'm glad to say, is our bookseller partner, and that's just part of the whole Making a Life, the conversation, I guess you'd say, program. So we're going to start with just Caitlin telling us about the Phoenix shop, and then we're going to come back to me and begin the conversation with Kate and Aaron. Hi, everyone. As Melanie said, my name is Caitlin Reclosado, and I am the book buyer at the amazing Phoenix shop at Nepenthe Restaurant. And um, I'm just really excited to be having both of these books here. I actually have them both with me. So this is the beautiful color duet, as well as the absolutely amazing Making a Life, but I don't think my camera's picking it up very well. So here we are. Um, I just wanted to share the story that, for those of you who don't know about us, our shop was dreamed into existence by Lolly Claffitt. And she was one of the founders of my the Nepenthe restaurant, and she was a really incredibly creative and generous woman. She highly valued community and culture, and she believed in building that through art and creativity, as well as conversation. And so when she envisioned the Phoenix shop, she saw it being a place full of 
beautiful art made by local artists, amazing like handmade objects from all over the world. And so that's something that we really strive to uphold today over 55 years later. And so just thank you everyone for coming out today to support this event. And for those of you who may be choosing to add one of these incredible books to your own collection, thank you from my heart for supporting independent family stone family owned stores such as ourselves. So thank you and back to you, Melanie. If you have any questions for Kay for Aaron, you guys, you can message them to me. I am asked a question and we will have that at the end of our conversation today. Okay. So probably I think the well, probably the question and answer will be about I feel like I could talk to either of them for days, so it's hard to minimize it to 35 minutes, but let's try to make it really good. I wanted to start with you, Kate. Um, we're mm -hmm. here to celebrate the value of, and importance of making by hand and your book, Color Duet. So to start, Kate, I just wanted to, for you to tell everyone, in case they don't realize, where are you? And then if you can tell us how the idea for color duets, the, pra the painting practice that you and Aaron um, shared for over 12 years, um, how that began. Well, I'm in my house in London. I'm uh, in, in my big studio uh, at, with my work wall behind me, which has lots of swatches of knitting on it because I'm making great big knitted uh, patchwork blankets out of my uh, swatches for different projects. Um, and uh, the, the reason that we <clears throat> decided to make a book and an exhibition was that uh, Aaron and I used to paint together all the time in Big Sur when I had uh, a, two weeks off. One week I would spend in Big Sur with my sister uh, and then she and I would go down to Mexico to a health farm called Rancho La Puerta, where we would have a wonderful time walking the mountains and eating good food. Um, so uh, I would paint uh, in that week before I went. Uh, and I was always very happy to break off from my textile work and get into painting. And Aaron would come and sit by my elbow and uh, paint, uh, a slightly different angle from what I was doing um, and we would paint these things and I, after about six or seven uh, times of going there and gathering these paintings together and realizing that we were painting the same objects over and over and over again I said wouldn't it be interesting to show the world these objects that we constantly come back and visit and do different poetic interpretations of these same objects. Um, and so it, it just seemed like a good idea to have both of our point of views and our uh, objects to be on display. And so when we finally have an exhibition, I'm hoping that we will have some of the objects there and the, <clears throat> the props that we use. Yeah. And, and certainly the paintings. Mm -hmm. And Aaron, first, if you could tell us where you are, make sure you all understand that. And, and if you could tell me some of your strongest um, and fondest memories of this experience with your uncle. Well, I am in my home, uh, which is our family home, the log cabin at Nepenthe. I mean, literally on top of the restaurant. If I threw a penny out the window, it might hit a customer on the head. So uh, I don't do that. But we're really, really snug up with the restaurant itself. For anybody who's ever been to Nepenthe, I'm right there. Um, and the thing that's so exciting about having worked with Cave, you know, painted with Cave, I mean, it's like since my childhood memory of Cave coming home from London or wherever he was traveling and just you drop everything to be in his presence. I mean, that was what you did because there was no one more exciting on this earth and so it has the thrill of that childhood memory has not dissipated when Kate Cave comes home um, to see my mom or to spend that time with her. It's been just an incredible, incredible um, 
privilege to say, yes, can I come and sit with you and paint at your side and, and, and learn from you and see how you do what you do. Kate paints in acrylics, I paint in oil. He's been a textile artist who has inspired the world. I get to have him to all to myself for, you know, a couple of hours every day for five days. And I just take it as, you know, a, a gift from the universe. And it's just um, endlessly educational, not just the painting, but the conversations we have, the, the stories that he shares with me, the revelations that we come to, the quiet moments between painting when we're just looking. Um, and, you know, my mother, Holly, you know, she would paint with us in the beginning and it was so wonderful because she's a beautiful painter. And I'm just gonna see if I can find a picture of here or her in the book. Kate and I dedicated this book to Holly because Holly, this is Holly and Kate together when they were very young. Holly was the one who, you know, she, she, we'd all paint together initially. And then she just got so busy running the restaurant that she abandoned the process, the project, which is very bittersweet because I would love for her to come back into that experience with Kate and me. She's a beautiful painter and um, I, I hold out that hope. Yeah. Um, I, I know what you wrote about in the book, um, the fact that in between painting, when you would take a break, you would knit. And I think there's a quote in the book of Cave saying, give me my knitting and I'm home. And so I'm wondering about how you feel with a paintbrush in your hand and how you feel with knitting needles in your hand and how those two things are the same and different. And so let's start with Cave and then go over to Aaron. Well, I, I think in terms of fiber. So um, when I'm painting uh, a design that's going to be printed onto cotton, I'm thinking about how that's going to be cut up and put into patchwork. And uh, when I'm doing my knitting, of course, I'm thinking about patterns and colors and constructions. And it's just, it's my way of being able to, like I designed a Shakespeare play once, uh, as you like it. And I sat down first of all and made little needle points and um, knitted swatches just to explore the color that was gonna go into that production. And that's just, just helps me to think. So textiles has always been a, a way that was a much more immediate and uh, sensual way of, of coming to terms with color. And when I went back to my painting after doing a lot of textile work, I found that my paintings were much more interesting color-wise because of the work I had done with the textiles. So uh, I think that working with balls of yarn and um, uh, colored fabrics is a wonderful way of exploring color. It's very immediate and very sensual. Yeah, and one thing um, that you and Aaron both do is you, you teach quite a bit. And I know when we were yeah. at a check-in meeting the other day, you said um, during this period when you can't travel that you really, really miss the connection with, with the people who take your classes and lots mm -hmm. of them. And one thing that I think you come from this artistic legacy, you know, many generations back. And when we look at your work and Aaron's work, it, it's easy to feel a little bit intimidated, like, oh, my work would never maybe be that good. And that's something that I always in myself personally try to get away from, because I know deep down in my soul that it's the process of mm. making and Absolutely. being that is the the real joy we don't do this for the if it was only a finished product i don't know that the process would even be worth it so mm. i'm just wondering if you can say something you know to our guests and to me to just bring that home that um you're not out there saying like, look at me look at how great this is you're out there saying join me <laughs> yeah but also it it th 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 there's nothing like starting to actually uh, depict something on paper or canvas or knitting needles or whatever, um, it makes you observe 
and think about pattern and color, well, it's not even a thought process. It's just an immediate instinctive reaction uh, of just grabbing things and, I don't know, putting a fiber together is just, it's so sensual, you know, and, and so immediate. It's just an extraordinary thing. Um, and it takes me right out of myself. Uh, you know, it's very interesting because Steve Loewy is a great photographer who photographed my first four books. And I remember once him setting up the camera and going to take a shot of one of my mitts against a wonderful background. And he said, oh, I'm so excited. I'm taking photographs and I love it. And I knew just what he meant. He was in his zone. And that's the thing about, um, you know, what I loved about textiles, you don't have to be perfect. I mean, there are people who dedicate their lives to being absolutely boringly perfect about quilt making <laughs> and uh, knitting, and it's just awful um, because they usually lack a, a sense of wonderful color and, and, and abandonment that I love to see in textiles. I love to see life in it. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it, it, as you're speaking, it reminded me of when I wrote about the life, which was that this instinct to use our hands to make things comes to us through our, it is an evolutionary birthright that comes to us through our DNA, as does this instinct to make the ordinary extraordinary. And, you know, when scholars and historians go back and, and look at objects that remain from thousands and thousands of years ago, they're not totally utilitarian. They are, you know, beautiful. They're clearly someone yeah. out of their way to make something special. And it seems to me that um, as a society, that those instincts are sometimes um, set aside a little bit and considered kind of frivolous, you know, that it's the focus is more on like making money or acquiring status. And yeah. it, my sense is that that is not the environment that you grew up in at FSA. That's not the environment that your mother created for all the people who, who gathered there. Um, and, I, and I get the sense, I mean, I often say that making by hand and making things beautiful is are my, that's part of my lifeline. That's how I survive. I couldn't, it's a path to my own wellness. Um, and I'm wondering, let's to get Aaron back into the conversation here. Aaron, if you could respond to that and then also talk to us a little bit about that beginning question about, you know, when you guys were painting versus when you were knitting um, and the other kinds of network you do, for example, I know you make a lot of bread. Yes, I do. Well, I mean, for me, every I believe every every child should be taught how to knit because there's absolutely no quicker way to return to home base in your essential being than when you have a pair of knitting needles in your hands. There is something absolutely anchoring and centering about it. And I find that when I am in extreme stress, whether it's being quarantined at home because of COVID-19 or during the times when Highway 1 has been uh, broken or mudslides have blocked us in for months and months on end and you've only been able to get out by hiking out or helicoptering in or you know everything in the world is thrown up in the air and you don't know where you're going to land that kind of anxiety the idea of painting kind of goes out the window and i find myself just immersed in textiles knitting balling up yarn uh, finding incredible comfort in that space within a within a minute or two minutes of just knitting a row. And then the challenge in knitting with just, or the, the gift, which is this extremely gorgeous array of balls of yarn in different colors, it tells you where to go. It's, it's, this, it's so immediate and so directive. And as an artist, I'm always listening to my paintings. I lay down a brush stroke of color and another brush stroke of color and I listen to what wants to come next, you know, in terms of shape and tone and texture and knitting and, and, and the textile world offers you this in your face joy. It's just this plethora of joy at available. And it has never been about perfection. I, I 
why, when I first went to London to visit Cape, when I was 28 years old, if he did needlepoint, I made a little needlepoint. You know, if he was painting, I did a little painting. I mean, I didn't have any pretensions at it being more than just for the joy of doing it badly. Um, I don't think anyone saw in any of those efforts any sign of hope or promise, but the, the pleasure of the pleasure of working in this arena of the visual arena, whatever form, or the handmade arena, whatever the form connects and centers us and deeply heals us. It, it's just unbelievable to me that it's not on the curriculum of, of every human being because we need that. And, and as we get more and more dis, disassociated and disconnected, how do we find our way back to that root? And for me, it's with a pair of knitting needles in my hand or, or making sourdough bread, making bread, arranging flowers, everybody, can find and, and finds for themselves some way in. And I would just say that part of what we both teach and advocate is for people to actually sit themselves down and do that and not just defer it to some imaginary time in the future when they're gonna have this free time that doesn't really exist. Like take the time now. It's, it's the message I get from, from CAFE um, again and again is, you know, no one's telling you to go write your novel or make your beautiful masterpiece. No one's really cares if you do or don't do it. It's only if you care and you do it that you get that, that product, you know, the book, this amazing book, you know, Color Duets, which we're so thrilled actually exists after years and years and years of painting and talking and imagining and you know that conversation that led to a conversation with the Monterey Museum of Art which said yes we want to do an exhibition of all of these paintings and everything else you've done you've been doing textiles and and otherwise to give an audience member a viewer a, a visitor to a museum that experience of the product within the context of the life mm -hmm. and that that would they weren't knocking on our door asking for that we thought it mattered enough to take it to them so i just say that you know believe in yourself and it's the message i got from cave from the beginning believe in yourself and listen to what you are you know you are hearing yourself say and out of that belief, extraordinary things come, you know, just extraordinary moments that you share with other people and with yourself. You know, so there you go. It's kind of funny. This makes me think about, um, you know, when I had the idea to do this conversation, the idea being that we would do this online for the time being and maybe for for a long time. And then it could also be combined with in-person conversations. Um, and I was kind of talking about the fact, the idea of doing it and then, oh, this might be hard, that might be hard, I'm not ready. And a friend of mine, Allie, who I think is listening, um, said, you know what my advice is for you, Melanie? And she said, I think you should just do it. And, you know, as I sit here right now, um, with all sorts of thoughts running through my head about how the conversation goes on. Um, I just think it goes back to this idea of if not now, when, you know, like if you've always dreamed of doing pottery or spending more time knitting or writing or whatever it is, that now is the time. Um, I wanted to, uh, earlier in the week, Kaif, uh, you, Kaif and Aaron, you both told me about certain images from the book that you would be interested in talking about. And I want to start with Kaif with white on white. I remember that they showed me a cover that had white. It was like white with a painting on it. And I, that was their first choice. And I remember I was on the phone with Tom and I said, oh, really? Like, but have you shown that to Cave? Like, do you, <laughs> I don't think Cave likes, I don't think Cave's comfortable with white. Um, and then I was not surprised when I saw the final beautiful cover and it wasn't the white one. And I'm not sure that they showed you the white one, but, um, Anyway, it was it was kind of interesting when I said that to Tom, and he, he laughed. He's like, oh, right. yeah. 
Um, but tell us about White on White and why you chose that as the as one of the paintings you wanted to discuss today. Well, when I when I first got to London, um, I I was not planning to. I was going to be here for three months, and I was going to go back to America. And um, here I am, fifty something odd years later. Uh, obviously, decided I would stay. But one of the things that uh, absorbed me was the idea of finding these beautiful pudding basins and uh, white plates and white pitchers and jugs and, and, and neutral colored things and bringing them together and paint, doing these still lights one after another after another and they were all white. I was not interested at all in color and, and I mean um, if, if any color got near me I wasn't just not at all interested. I, I, it was just that pure white reflective kind of world with soft shadows and everything was, uh, it was a very interesting mood that I, that I got myself into. It was partly inspired by Gaudi going to uh, Barcelona and seeing the Parc Guerrero and the underneath of that is all done in sets of China that are broken up and, you know, uh, plates and um, I don't know, lots and lots and lots and lots of, of wonderful round shapes and so forth of saucers and cups and jugs uh, that are stuck onto the ceiling of this wonderful church, of uh, this wonderful uh, park. And that really inspired me. And I, and I came home and I was just, I just got into this white world. That so that's why I was interested to, to uh, talk about that and this one painting that exist from that period. And how did it change? You clearly made the shift away from Well, the, the, the way, the reason it changed is that I, I started finding this wonderful museum called the Victorian Albert Museum, which was this great treasure trove of decorative arts from all over the world. And so there were these amazing collections of Indian paintings, Indian miniatures and Persian miniatures. And they were these tiny little paintings that were just stuffed with pattern and color. And so here were these magical things of a carpet with paisleys. Uh, and then there would be a woman with a, a, an outfit that was covered with roses. And then there would be, you know, her trousers would be striped and her little shoes would be plaid and then polka dots on her scarf. And, you know, all these different things put together, but it was gorgeous. and harmonious and wonderful and I just realized this whole magical mood that you can create with just one pattern following another and so I started going down to Portobello Road where there was this wonderful flea market and every weekend I would haunt that road and I would find little rose covered uh, teapots and little saucers and, and cups and uh, everything had patterns. And then I would find a beautiful chintz tablecloth, say, that, that was covered with flowers that was English. Or, or I would find a patchwork quilt, which was covered with lots and lots of different patterns cut up and put together. And I would put these down and I would make these pattern on pattern intricate paintings. And it just became, I went from not being interested in color to being totally fascinated with the colors that were in these objects. Yeah, what you're saying reminds me of something you told me with all those years ago in the Shetland Islands. And um, we were talking about the landscape there and you told me about um, the fact that a bus, you had talked to a bus driver who one morning he had, was driving the bus very early and the, it was the most amazing light on the snow and everything looked pink and he saw that um, the people on the bus were all reading their newspapers and <laughs> were really struck by that and you said you know you feel like um, I can't remember the quote exactly but it was something like you know kind of your mission in life was to tell people to like look up look out yeah. see the world and when you talk about you know the effect of seeing all those things on Portobello Road and the way that you talk about color and the way you talk mm -hmm. about pattern is, and I know you don't have a cell phone and you don't work on the computer and that's not realistic for all of us, but certainly um, making a life where you could stay tuned in in that way has been yeah. amazingly productive and seems like uh, 
inspiring for you. Um, I, I want to go switch to Aaron, um, and I want to talk to you about one of the images that you picked, which surprisingly was not a painting, and it was the hat box quilt. And I, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about the quilt. I know that the fabrics have a story um, that has to do with your grandmother, Cape's mother, and um, and the process of making that quilt um, is important to you. And I, I think you talked about if your your house were on fire, that was what you would grab. Absolutely, and it's true. Um, I'm just scrolling through the book trying to find that painting, that 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 quilt, but. Um, I'm sure it's here somewhere. Oh, here it is. So it has, I, I'm a mom. I had two kids. I was running a nonprofit arts organization and working at Nepenthe doing the books in the, the what we call the cage, counting money and um, trying to do a million things at once as all mothers or single fathers or whoever's, anybody who's taking care of living beings, whatever, whoever you are, you know this dilemma of how to get it all done. And so I was seeing Cape's uh, first quilt book and it blew my mind. This, this pattern that he had in his, in his book, the, the hat box, just everything was in it. It just reminded me of my grandmother and her grandmother who traveled to Europe in the twenties and thirties and lived, you know, lived a life where you would be actually traveling with hat boxes filled with glamorous hats. So it took me five years. I went block by block. It took me, you know, I would do 20 minutes, half an hour. And if I was lucky an hour a day, Kate would come home and say, what's going on with your quilt? And I would say, well, you know, I could show him a few more, a few more blocks that I'd made. Um, but to me, that's part of its beauty because most of us don't have that much time in our day to work on a creative project that doesn't have some practical purpose behind it. And this speaks to me about how desperately I wanted to have a little bit more of that in my life during a time when it was really almost impossible. I think that's very much the way it is for most, for most people. Um, and it was, just scraps from my gra my grandmother has had in this house that I live in. It's still here now. This enormous box that was built to keep the grizzly bears out of the provisions uh, back in the 1920s when there were still grizzly bears in Big Sur. And the lid is so heavy. It takes two people to lift the lid. It's filled to the brim with fabrics that go back 70 years. And I just thought anything I need to make this quilt is in this box. I mean, it never really even occurred to me to go buy any fabric at all. It just seemed like get into what you've got. So, um, and that's the way we were raised. You just look around if you needed something to do for fun or you were trying to create something for the Christmas tree because God forbid you would be going to shop for that um, because no one had any money. It was just find what you can and make do. And the quilt for me was a, a, an artistic expression of all of that. It was, what do you have? Make it work. Find these beautiful juxtapositions, put them together. The imagery itself was so evocative of our family story going back generations and that kind of nostalgia. And, um, and then just the process of making it where it wasn't you know, sitting down and designing a quilt in a day and making it for sale or for a purpose per se, other than the purpose of making something beautiful. And each square was an opportunity to make something beautiful and just try again and again, put these things together and see how they speak to each other. It's so nice. And I have to say, I, last night I was going through photographs um, from my time in Big Sur and I have, I took a bunch of photos in your home, including of your quilt. And I think it was also your, I think it was either you or Holly. It was a frame with cork where you kept your earrings and I've still been planning on recreating that. <laughs> Is that you or Holly's house? That's my mom. Okay. That's Holly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, so Kate. Let's move on. We've talked about white on white and 
other two paintings that you talked, you mentioned wanting to talk about are Rosy Circles and Green and Turquoise Study. Right. Start with either. Tell us what you want to tell us about those paintings. Well, we could, we could start with that little, um, the circles, uh, which is this one. I don't know if you can see. Uh, it's, it, it's a little group of objects that are kind of circular in form, most of them. And the circle, I can remember when I was first starting to do needlepoint, I was asking somebody how to uh, create a circle. I think I wanted to do an apple or something. And um, they, uh, they said, oh, you can never make a perfect circle in needlepoint. Just forget it. Well, that, of course, was like a red rag to a bowl. I was like, you know, do a circle if it killed everybody. And so you can see behind me is this big black and white circular piece of knitting uh, that I, I like very much. That's sort of grabbing the idea from an ancient uh, Peruvian textile. So anyway, the idea of, of, of circles uh, is something that comes up and up and up in my work. And when I was painting, I had this little um, beige colored table and I was putting these little objects on it and they were just like kind of round things that were sitting in a desert, you know, of endless space. And then these little circular forms and it just it touched me. I just was very moved by the tautness and the kind of excitement that was created by this little pile of circular objects and and you know a couple of them are our plastic uh fruit <laughs> that holly had in her house and we painted them over and over and over again because they never rot <laughs> so it's just kind of a joy uh to create that and then on the other page is is aaron's study of of looking at at the circular objects on that same beige card table so you can see the different angles that we were both working from and she added a few more <laughs> little uh, punchy oranges and things to the uh, arrangement. And then the green and turquoise study? Now the green and turquoise study is something I really love. Um, I, I feel, um, I picked that because I felt it was one of the paintings that really came off. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm sorry that we can't show these, uh, you know, properly, but this is all about long tall shapes all these the necks of these bottles um are very very beautiful to me just one after another i love sequences of things and patterns that are created by repetition of shape mm -hmm. and so that was fascinating to me and then of course the coloring i really loved i love that all these soft greens and turquoises and then suddenly punching in that little orange uh Vase, you know, that really, really strong, sharp little orange. And um, it's just, you know, fascinating. I, 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 that was a painting I got completely lost in, the kind of mood of these lovely colors and, and beautiful shapes, I think. And when that was happening and you're getting lost in a painting and the process when you were side by side. Yeah. Like, were there times when you were chattering away, times when you were in silence, were you playing music, were you eating? Like, what, what did it feel like to be there? Well, I'm a great advocate of talk radio. And so fresh air on the radio uh, in America. See, in, here in England, we have Radio 4, which is just brilliant. It's just a, a poetry readings, plays, uh, wonderful interviews with all sorts of accents from all over these islands. Uh, and I'm I'm fascinated by that. I absolutely listen all the time to talk radio because it really absorbs my mind while I'm knitting or painting or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was listening to a lot of interviews on on fresh air mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in uh, the public radio. Yeah. And Aaron, can you tell us first, like from your perspective, like how it felt for you to be in the room with Kate? painting um and then also the talk about the two paintings that you chose to talk to for this conversation the sunflower overcast day and wraps with fruit tin 
you know, I would get there late. He would always have set up already. He was a halfway through the first painting by the time I would show up because I always had some reason why I had to stay home and finish getting a loaf out of the oven or a house gas to eat breakfast or something. So even though he'd come all the way from London to paint here and I live across the street from where my mother's studio is, I was the one who showed up late. So I would be sort of trying to grab a coffee and get over and quickly catch up. And um, Kate's super fast and I'm a fast painter too. So he would really literally be finishing the first painting when I first started. And I just wanted to get set up as quickly as I could so I could be dropping in to that space that he was already in. Um, it's, it was such a high because the feeling of just focusing your attention in a concerted way on these objects and seeing them, trying to see them and see what was happening with shadows and light and color, a cool green on a, on a, on a warmer green against a hot orange, like the painting that Kate was just describing. That, it's, you know, if you might walk by something like that and not even notice it, but it, when you stop and you really take the time to observe and see, which is what observational painting gives you. It gives you that experience of presence and focus and attention to the moment you're in. The light, the object, the space, all of those things are coming into your painting. So it's like dropping into the most meditative but cozy and, con you know, friendly kind of space with someone else who you know is absolutely there with you or even further there and the delight of of seeing cave responding to something that i might have just not even noticed and feeling like okay i need to i need to look again because there's something going on here that's amazing and magical and i don't even i'm not recognizing it and it might have been the second day or the third day or the last painting of all that all of a sudden my brain would kind of click and I would really see a flash of what to Kate is apparent all the time. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go back to the sunflower painting, which is one of my choices because it's always a kick for me when I do a painting, and this is an example, I mean, maybe I'll hold it up. So if, if I get spotlighted, or, okay, here we go. Um, I did the one that I'm tapping on this side and Kate did this one. So they're side by side in the book as part of our duets series. And I was just thrilled with this because I love being able to find the beauty and the nuance of those kind of unnameable grayed colors in the background that really supported the vibrancy of the bright yellow sunflower petals and I was very pleased because Kaif looked at mine and said oh I quite like how you did that and I was just like well my work is done I can die a happy woman um, <laughs> the other painting is uh, that I chose is this one which is on the back of the book and this was really for me the, the the tour de force painting because of the very last time we painted together we were in London and Kaif set up a still life I walked in the room and he said, this is for you. And he walked out and had to go and do a million other things. I mean, so many projects going on that he would steal time before painting with me there. And, and I wanted you to have the best view of that. You know, yes. it, it was a very cramped little studio and you got the special. It was, view. Yeah. It was like the most generous gift because he set it up and then he sat me down right where I could just take it all in in the most perfect way and left me to do that and, and let me have that that moment and I mean it's really a complicated painting full of all kinds of stuff going on just pattern on pattern. Can I tell you, this is the fabric this is the big Japanese obi uh, we like bold and <laughs> this bold or what or what so I was <laughs> I sort mean, of riveted stronger than that <laughs> And uh, he threw down the challenge and I did not dare walk away from it. And there you go. So I, 
I wanted this painting to be, if that was the last painting I ever got to paint with Cave, I felt like I had done him proud. And, um, you know, you I, I didn't come did. into painting feeling like I had much to offer, except that I really enjoyed it. And I loved trying really hard to do it, you know. So I feel like it kind of was, that's how I began. Can I add oh. also to, to your talk, Erin, this is the, the tin that we painted. That this, these are the kind of objects I would find in the flea market. And this beautiful little tin with fruit on it, the boldness of these colors was part of that still life. And so that's the kind of thing that attracts both of us mm -hmm. uh, as painters. Yes. And the last thing I'll just throw in there is when we were painting in California the last time, we were listening to Krista Tippett and her program on being and if you're not familiar with it if you want to download podcasts it's a fabulous immersive hour of conversation with poets and philosophers and writers and it was a beautiful kind of um, atmosphere that Kafe and i would just paint and listen to krista tippett and on being and then break for a cup of coffee or my mom would make soup and we get to have a cup of soup together and eat lunch while she was working and that was another gift you know a really bittersweet gift that my mom gave to us to have this time together while she kept the family business going at Nepenthe so mom you know this book would not exist without you that's that's beautiful I think we all um it's interesting you know we all owe a lot to our families and in particular our moms and our grandmothers. And one thing that I found in my research for my book, Making a Life, you know, a common denominator, like among all the, these different makers that I met with, was that almost all of them talked about their mother or their grandmother having the biggest influence on, on the choices that they made in their lives. Um, and then I'll just say, I think the two of you should be guests on on being, and I don't say that just to flatter you. I think it would be absolutely wonderful. So maybe we should start, all of us should start emailing Krista Tippett. <laughs> right now we are starting to run out of time. So I want to um, open it up to questions and I'm hoping that Caitlin has gathered them. <laughs> I have, we have gotten a lot of great questions from the audience. So I'm gonna to try to keep oh, it to about a few because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, one thing that uh, somebody was wondering was, do either of you have a formal art education? Um, I went to uh, an art school that was uh, a four-year course, or you could go even longer if you wanted to, and I lasted about six months. I had a scholarship to go there, and they were very upset when I left, but I, I just thought, what I'm doing here is just drawing every day and I could just go home and I could learn, you know, I could just put myself through the paces and, and observe life and record it. That was my education. But they also brought out the color wheel while I was in that school and that they didn't see me for dust. I thought that was the work of the devil. So I was out of there. I was not interested in, in theoretical color. Huh. And Aaron? Uh, I took a drawing class when I was in when I was an undergrad, but I had a baby somewhere between year one and year two, and he became my great master project, uh, Chai, and he had a formal education all the way through master's degree in, in illustration. Uh, so I learned a lot from watching him grow into that incredible artist and human being that he is. The way I learned artistically was um, by sitting at the elbow of someone who did something I wanted to learn like Kate teaching me to do needlepoint or my grandmother who taught me to knit when I was four or um, take a class from someone who uh, there was a local painter in Big Sur is a local painter named Rana Rio who taught a lot of the women of Big Sur how to paint 25 30 years ago I think she's still teaching and I when I wanted to understand oil painting she was my my teacher for three years and gave me a really tremendous grounding in the technique um, and so much more that I use to this day. And now, Erin, you're offering classes on Facebook Live, right? Um, yeah, I have a YouTube channel called
called Awaken the Artist Within. And I offer free art classes there. And I have a Facebook group that's private where people can join and be encouraged and mentored and share their processes with the rest of us. We have about 350 artists who go through, um, share, share their work. And it's really all about encouraging each other to show up at the easel and keep going. All right. Um, so for the second question, I'm going to kind of combine two. Um, there was a curiosity of, did you guys work before you made art? And if so, how did you make the leap into being more of a full-time artist? And as a full-time artist, how do you really keep that creative energy growing and building kind of every day? Well, I, if, I, if I can start, with my career, I decided um, very early on that I would uh, absolutely not work, uh, that I would devote my time to my art and I would make that art pay if it killed me in the meantime. And I almost starved to death. I mean, I got, I got incredibly low. Uh, there was times when, um, I remember uh, inviting somebody to dinner. I had a little one room flat in San Francisco and I covered the walls with paintings and invited this uh, art critic to uh, come and have dinner with me. And he didn't say anything about the paintings the whole time and I thought, if he doesn't buy a painting, I am going to have to um, just give up, you know, and, and go back and live at home. And so um, just as dinner was finishing and he got up to leave and he got to the door and he turned the door handle and he looked back and he said, how much is that painting in the corner? And I thought, I'm going to survive. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I, I I was very very excited, and I sold him the painting, and I did. I lived for uh, a, a month on that, and but in that time, I was able to sell other paintings. And so I've always lived off my work. Erin, uh, not 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 so true for me. I have done everything from busing tables to uh, running a daycare center in Burlington, Vermont, to. Um, starting and running a, a, an arts education organization for families in Big Sur to being, being the, the, the daily person who goes and sits in a cage and counts the money um, at Nepenthe. I've been working since I was 10 years old. My first job was buttering the hamburger buns for our world famous Ambrosia Burger at Nepenthe. And I think Nepenthe taught me the value of work, the value of community, working with other people where you have that kind of pressure to get the job done and you have that energy from other people, which also is really helpful. Um, but I knew from a very early age that there was something I wanted to do that wasn't the dictates of an employer. And even when my son was a baby and I was, Tom and I were living on be, you know, beans and rice and um, in uh, the frozen wastelands of Vermont when I was 19 or 20, trying to scrape a living by, um, I would take time to write articles and send them to magazines, hoping to break in and get some money doing that. Or I would knit a sweater and sell it for a couple hundred bucks, which was a lot of money in 1983. So I, um, I always felt like there was some, you had to carve out a little bit of time for yourself in that way so that that didn't just die. And as I got older and more successful with the work I was doing financially, I would say, well, what is this time you have left over for? It's for putting into this creativity. And then there was a moment when I just, just I was literally sitting on a mountaintop in Japan as a visiting teacher in Hamada, Japan in September. And it was 9-11, um, the few days after 9-11. And I remember, painting from this little tea shop looking out over the valley below with my daughter and my husband and um, my guide and thinking the whole world was just given this flash of you know this devastation and then what next and I thought what next for me you know how do I want to carry forward in my life that I maybe need to reflect on and not just do what I've been doing. And that was really a moment of decision that I would really do everything in my power to move into 
my painting life with full heart. That's beautiful. Caitlin, do you want to ask one more question and then we'll yep. Yeah, I have, um, before I ask the last question kind of for Kate and Erin, um, I just want to, to be able to tell our audience, there's been a lot of questions, Melanie, as to whether this recording will be available afterwards. Assuming our technology has worked, um, yes, it will. And everyone okay. signed up will um, get an email with the link to the recording. Okay, um, great. <laughs> so, um, kind of the final question, which I think is probably one of the, the best ones to end on, is Kate and Aaron, you guys both have such a long and beautiful legacy of sh being artists together and nurturing each other. And so one question we got was, what is one thing that you have each learned from each other? And what's one thing that the other person has really influenced you in as an artist? Uh, well, I would say that what I've learned from Erin is she's a very visceral painter. You know, she's really into the paint strokes and the atmosphere created by um, oil paint, which is quite different. And I used to paint in oil paint, so I know kind of what that is. Uh, and, and probably I was a lot freer and more brush strokes and so forth uh, when, I, when I was doing working with oil. But um, so I, I, I love that. I love seeing, um, that's why I loved her sunflower and, and, and said that because it, would, it would had this wonderful life to it. Uh, the, the actual brush strokes are just oozing with life. So that's what I've, I've learned from, from Erin is the, is the attack she has on the painting. Yeah, so Kaif, Kaif and I, uh, Cape's 25 years older than me, so he has always been sort of this um, figure of um, accomplishment and, and, and this figure of inspiration since my first memory of being four years old and hearing him tell me stories when he would babysit me and my brother and our cousins and my mom was working and he'd take us off and, you know, um, just regale us with stories that were so touching and so heartfelt and... I, I just feel like Kaif, his, you know, the word inspiration is so overused. Kaif lifts the veil. He, he changes the energy in the room and he makes you see that things are possible that you might have just been doubting and didn't think were possible. And I remember this one time visiting him when um, I had this project in my mind and I said, what, what if no one thinks it matters? And he just, he'd been lying in the sun, basking in the sun, lying on the rocks and the beach. And he just, his eyes came bursting open and he sat straight up and he said, never, ever think that. Don't ever think that. You know, when you start going down the road of what if no one thinks this matters, you're doomed. And um, I don't know if he remembers that moment, but I remember thinking, man, if I think it matters, then I need to put my energy behind it because that belief and that energy is what's going to convince somebody else that it matters. If I'm wiffle waffling or kind of being, I'm not sure, you know, how, how, how easy it is for someone else to dismiss you and the idea. So yeah. that kind of, um, that moment was really pivotal and it, it really has stuck with me because, um, you know, Kate has shown me, I mean, who could imagine somebody making a career as a knitter, you know? I mean, forget it. It's like that when Kate <laughs> became the world's fam most famous knitter, forget it. It's not a career path that anybody would recommend or take. So it's like, what, who, who are you? And what do you want to do with this life that you get to have? And then when you figure that out, just, man, do everything in your power yeah. to um, just stand up for that. That is so beautiful. And it, and it really sort of leads me to what I think is a, a nice way to conclude, um, which is, you know, this idea of making a living and making a life and how do we balance that? And what are the small choices and the big choices that we make each and every day that affect or determine the life that we lead? So if there's anything, you know, from my perspective that I could leave everybody with, it's really just to believe in your dreams and, and, and really listen to your inner calling. And it may be that, you know, you're not going to, you know, make a career out of your creative expression, 
and that's fine, but you are going to make a good life for yourself. And it doesn't matter if it can't be yeah. full time, just don't let it be no time. And think about when you choose to scroll through your phone or you choose to watch something on Netflix or you choose to, I don't know, go to see a movie that you're not that interested in, whatever it is. I mean, if you can really um, be clear on what your priorities are. And for me, I feel wholeheartedly that when we listen to our inner selves, when we find a form of creative expression that allows us to be ourselves, that we are on a pathway to our own wellness. Um, with that, I'm just gonna tell everyone that um, Making Life the Conversation, the official program is concluding now. Um, I hope that we will have another in this series. I am talking to um, the African American Quilt Guild of Oakland as a possibility for a, a second guest. Um, and just to, to finish up, I, I just wanted to give both Kate and Aaron um, a chance to say one more thing if you feel compelled. And then I am gonna tell you that Aaron and I are gonna stay on the call for about 15 more minutes. I'm not sure if Kate is able to, but um, if you wanna hang around and ask us a few more questions, that is a possibility for Aaron and, and me, so. Aaron. I, I, th I thought Aaron's point at, at the end there uh, was a very, very, uh, cogent and perfect uh the whole thing about believing in yourself uh and not not wasting your energy thinking about what other people think of your work um you know i was once i gave a workshop in um scandinavia somewhere in norway actually and uh this uh i i was describing a, a quilt that I had made and I was pointing out to everybody in the room all the things that were wrong with it that were weak that hadn't worked that we would chosen the wrong materials and so forth and so on and then at the end I said oh by the way somebody wanted to buy this quilt and I turned around and said who was it wanted to buy it and this woman said not anymore <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that's perfect we can we can queer our pitch very easily Mm -hmm. So, and, and everybody has that thing of, you know, doubt of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Don't put it out there. Don't point out the weakness in your work. Yeah. You know? I mean, my mother, my mother made a cake once and she's, she dropped it on the floor and then scooped it back up again and brought it to the table. It looked perfectly fine. And, but she made the mistake of saying, oh, I dropped this cake on the way to the table. I'm sure it's going to taste fine. And I just remember thinking, oh, mom, you should never have told us, you know. Um, I would add my two thoughts for a wrap up are two. One is, if you are in doubt, go into nature. Um, nature grounds you. It grounds your soul. It puts you back into an understanding of the universal perfection of this incredible universe we live in because we can certainly doubt that if you're watching the news you certainly are not believing that everything is perfect um, but when you go out into this world that we live in and you are experiencing nature there is a cosmic underpinning of rightness that can infuse you and bring bring you wholeness to go back into your life with energy and a sense of hope which we so desperately need Right I mean, now. I don't know what what the what the flowers are like in, uh, for the, in America for this season, but here in England, I have never experienced such beautiful color and total abundance of wow. the the rose bushes are groaning with roses. It's like four <laughs> times as much as ever before, and so every little front garden as you as we take our hours walk every day is just a joy to behold mm. so, yeah the uh, birds the birds here is what we've uh, noticed it's just oh everywhere yeah. um yeah. and and the second thing you know is um i mean you can get really low and nature can really restore you and you need to you need to be restored you need to find those ways um you know the world needs your voice right now and you need to find a way to be available to that work Second thing is just this community. Um, some people are just fine, you know, working alone and they can come up with all their own structures and systems and inspirations perfectly fine. But the majority of us really benefit from having a community, 
whether it's a virtual community right now, which is what we have available to us, um, but other people who are like spirited in that sense of, you know, wanting so much to, to find those connections with the things that you value and are thinking are exciting and important. If you can build a way to kind of connect with your tribe and to encourage one another, um, it's, it's a life changer. So often I find that people bring their stuff to, they bring their work into our private Facebook group where we share our paintings with each other. And the whole room is responds so positively. And someone went from being sort of wanting to throw in the towel to all of a sudden doing 10 more paintings. And that encouragement is like just Absolutely. everything. It can Very be everything. Good. So, you know, we need to encourage each other and we need to allow ourselves to be encouraged and we need to find our, our people to do that wherever they may be. Yeah. Cultivate good friends. Very important. Yeah. That's perfect. And be, and be a good friend. Be a, yeah, you know. Yeah. 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 You know, be encouraging be, yourself and, and yeah. cultivate people that encourage you. Absolutely. Forget about the ones who are always throwing rocks at you. Absolutely. <laughs> or pissing you. No, hey, no names, no names. Caitlin, are there any more questions coming yeah. through that you want to ask in just last few wrap up minutes? Yeah, Aaron, could you say that last bit again? Forget the people who are throwing stones at you. at you. Yeah, forget the people who are sto throwing stones at you. We, cult we often, it's certain times of our life, we really cultivate all those people. So we hold them so tight. We sort of feel like, oh, they're setting me on my path or they're, 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 they're steering my boat. They're, they're giving me necessary critique or criticism. Um, and not to say that we don't need that too, but you, at some moments in time, you may look around and realize there's certain people who are just absolutely draining your energy and always against you and always throwing you down and in a loving way um, sometimes. But really, if you are defeated, that's the end of the game. You can't even get up and improve something when you're just, your soul has been knocked down. Yeah. You need to be connecting again and again with the energy to fight, to live to fight another day. And who are those people who you leave their presence and you cannot wait to get back and start a new knitting project or uh, begin a new painting or try a new recipe or plant something in your garden. I mean, whatever the thing is, um, those are the people who change your life. Those are the people who feed your life and feed your soul. And I have learned to be very careful about who I share new work with because a lot of people are taught that the way you are a good crit critic, you know, the way that you are a good friend artistically is just by tearing apart something. Um, but that can be something at some point that's useful. But as a rule, I would say that those, those crit, you know, the, the desire to tear you down is pretty strong in people. And that's just something I avoid. I don't, yeah. I don't really find it useful. I find it more useful to have somebody say, oh my God, carry on, do 10 more. And then 10 more iterations later, I will have discovered something that Perhaps they wanted me to learn the first time, but I got there my, I, my own way by continuing to be excited about something and not just feeling dis no. despair over my failure to get there. So that's just my, my personal well, I mean, this, that makes me think that when I was uh, just starting out, somebody had said to me, get a really good sketchbook, a hardbound sketchbook, it, it's nice and don't rip the pages out just keep working and keep going back and in an odd hour look at everything that you've done keep reviewing what you've done and that was marvelous uh, advice because uh even your very tentative little sketches in the beginning can have something a seed of something that you can build on I think this thing of working in, in sequences is so useful for an artist in whatever medium you're working in. And you can see in Cape's work where he's, he's taking the same motif and he's doing it again and again and again, just trying different combinations of colors and textures. And um, it's, it, there's no shame as a textile artist in doing, say, Persian poppies, which is my obsession as a knitter. Just every row is a new chance to try it again. As a painter, 
I do exactly the same thing. I set up a still life and I paint one version of it. And if I stopped there, I would only have learned this much, you know, and then I'd be saying to people, you know, what do you think of my little painting? And it's all, oh, well, you know, whatever they think. But if I do 10 or 20 and I keep being excited and learning something new and thinking, what if I change the background? Oh, let me change the light or uh, it's not, something's not quite working. Let me change something to make the colors more harmonious. By the time I've done 10 iterations of that idea, I have learned so much. And this is the thing about the book color duets is that we were coming back every year and painting the same objects in the same room um, again and again. And we were just uh, endlessly entertained. I think somebody in my family asked me, asked Kate and me, don't you ever get bored you know, <laughs> looking at these same painting, same things and painting them again? And both Cape and I said resoundingly, no, we never get bored because every time you sit down to look at something, there is something to learn from it. And that rooting yourself as a painter and observing and depicting the value of drawing is so enormous for, the, for a painter or for any human being to give yourself something to focus on and then just be with that and try to capture it in line on paper. All you need is a pen and a notebook or a pencil, but pencils are bad because they have erasers and you want to get away from that. Yeah, um, exactly. That's why I love ink. Yeah. So that's a practice for anybody that isn't necessarily to become an artist per se, but rather is an artistic way to be present with what you see and those line drawings begin to build your muscles for observation and understanding of how things relate to each other. And all that is so useful, not just for your paintings or, or the work you do visually, but that time spent as say 10 minutes of sketching something or drawing something, you are so present and you see so much more when you've done that, it can transform your day. All right, so I think we've gotten to the end of our extra 15 minutes, although um, I think we should all just tune in to um, Aaron's YouTube and Facebook classes for more inspiration. Um, I am going to um, end the meeting in a moment, which feels really weird, like how do you gracefully exit Zoom? But, <laughs> but I want to uh, ask Kate, um, if there's anything you would like to say to end it, and if you don't have anything in particular, you could just tell us what your favorite flavor of ice cream is, but I would like you to have. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, you know, it's funny because I feel like we've just gotten started now, you know, talking about this whole thing of, of creativity. You want to stay on? <laughs> Well, no, I, I, I'll, I'll let you guys natter away, but I'm, I'm just, I'm very, um, very happy that we've done this, and um, I'm very proud of the book. I think it's a beautiful little book, and I think that anybody who's um, interested, for instance, in the wonderful Italian painter Morandi, who painted the same objects in his room year after year after year, spent his whole life painting the same objects. And it's kind of, we take our cue from him um, and we're certainly never bored. And um, thank you, Melanie, for uh, hosting this uh, wonderful thing and, and, and having the chance for Aaron and I to uh, tell of our appreciation for each other. Yeah, I'm honored to do it. Thank you so much, Kate and Aaron. And thank you to everyone who's been working behind the scenes. Um, thank you, Tom. My tech, my tech yep. guru, husband, everything. <laughs> so, um, by the book, I would just say the big teacher when I don't have cave around is his books. And this book is an amazing opportunity to get to know cave as a painter. We don't, there's no other art book that exists in the entire world that features cave as a painter, as a painter. That's and true. this is and cave has been painting since he was a child so this is really long overdue and what's kind of thrilling too is that the relationship between one artist and another artist of another generation 
is woven through every single page and um, there's no one way to do anything. So in this book, Color Duets, what you can see is how one artist sees something and how another artist sees it. And there's a, there's a beautiful difference that it really should encourage anybody to feel like they have their viewpoint and it's going to be a little different or a lot different and it's valuable. And it's when all those voices are being supported and heard that we have the most beautiful music. So this book contains that dialogue and a visual way and also a lot of personal stories for anybody who needs a little inspiration. Wonderful. Thank so you. buy books. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day or evening depending on where you are in the world and hopefully we'll see you again back here on Zoom or in person or who knows where. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Melanie.